I remember the first time I was ever exposed to domestic violence. My home life growing up was very much non-violent. I was the oldest of three boys, and of course we fought sometimes, just like all brothers do, but really it was more arguing than fighting. We never got violent with each other. And my parents? I could never imagine either of them even thinking about hitting the other. It's just not something that would ever be considered. They had been married for 56 years when my dad passed away in 2016. So I guess you could say I grew up pretty sheltered from that kind of thing. I just never saw it. But there was a time when I had a regular job, working in an office with probably 30 or 40 other people. This was quite a few years ago, and it was here in Florida, in downtown Tampa. I went into work one day, and that morning I was surprised to see one of my co-workers, a young lady, probably around 25 or so, had come to work with a bad black eye. Actually, it was more than just her eye. Much of one side of her face was bruised and swollen. And when I saw her, in my sheltered little world, I actually wondered what had happened. I didn't ask her about it, because we weren't what you would call close friends, and it really was none of my business anyway. But later on, as I heard others discussing it, I realized that she had been beaten by her boyfriend. And at first, I was really surprised. Like, why would anyone do that? She's such a nice girl, always smiling, always friendly. It didn't make sense. Then I got angry. I imagined what it would be like if someone did that to my wife or my kids. So that was my first exposure to the results of domestic violence. But the reality is that it's very, very common. According to the National Domestic Violence Hotline, more than one out of three women and one out of four men in the U.S. will experience rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner. That's the situation that Shireen found herself in. She was in constant fear of Jerome's anger and his violence and she didn't think there was any way out. Finally, she confided in a co-worker, and neither of them had any idea of the terrifying experience they were in for that day. Real people in unreal situations. There is a man standing in front of me in my bedroom. My friend has been shot. I'm in the literally inside the river, and I'm inside my car. He had told me multiple times that he was going to set himself on fire. If you say my name or try to look at me, I'm going to kill you. And he was just sobbing. He said, Mom, Mom, tell me you're going to be okay. And I jumped on the hood of the car, and I held on. And I looked into the garage, and he was hanging from the rafters. I had somebody standing on my neck. He's better to me dead. I want him dead. I'm Scott Johnson, and this is What Was That Like? Can you describe the first time you met Jerome? We had met on a dating site, and he had come over for dinner, something simple like that. I had been single for a few months, and he seemed really nice, and he seemed very calm. Just like the kind of person that you'd want to be around. Whenever we met, we we weren't exclusive for about a week or so, um, but we ended up really liking each other and we had good chemistry at the time. What was it about him that you, that kind of caught your eye or what did you like about him? Uh, Me personally, whenever I meet someone, I just, I, I like to meet people that can keep up with me conversation wise, intellectually, politically, you know, if I say something, I want them to have an opinion. And he was after a relationship, not just a, a meetup. So that was what I liked about him. Do you remember the first sign of trouble? And how how long had you been dating when that happened? Let me answer that in two parts. I got pregnant very quickly. Within a month of us dating, I actually got pregnant. And the first time that I really suspected, oh, wow, this was a terrible decision, um, was when I told him I was pregnant. And he asked me, when are we getting an abortion? And that just struck me to the core. And I was like, oh, no. And this feeling of dread like this was not good. That wasn't the only time he asked me for an abortion either, just the first time. Obviously, this is not something that you guys had planned on or talked about ahead of time at all. 
No, not we hadn't had a conversation about family planning, but you know, we're adults, we knew what would happen. So, you know, it wasn't unexpected at the same time. So then after at some point after that, I assume, he began to be abusive. What happened then? So I noticed that whenever he was at home, his phone would go off. And I noticed the icon for the specific dating site that we actually met on, you know, very noticeable. And uh, I had asked him about it. And he would yell at me saying that I was so stupid. He already told me he wasn't on it, that I should just ignore it. Like, wow, how can you be so dumb? You know, I'm sitting here with you, aren't I? You know, stuff, stuff like that. So after that, he started getting like every day would escalate. And uh, there was one point where he would like lock me in our bedroom. And he would play his game on Xbox and talk to his girlfriend on the Xbox game. And, uh, and I'd be in the back room pregnant and crying. <laughs> it was, it was pretty awful. There was not a lot of good time in this relationship. You had to, I mean, at that point, you had to be just thinking, man, how in the world did I get myself in this mess? Oh, yeah. Like backed into a corner with no ladder. And um, we were, we both had jobs. So financially, um, we were both contributing to this apartment. And I, like so many, you know, uh, situations of domestic violence, that financial obligation is something that keeps women where they are. I didn't have money to move anywhere. I had no one to take me in. So I felt stuck. Were there ever any, any cases of physical abuse? Uh, yeah. So there was um, a situation where he, we were sitting on the couch and he was wearing a leather belt and he was really skinny. So there was like a lot of extra belt there and he grabbed and he hit me on the arm and I was like, ow. And I guess he liked my reaction, he took his belt off and just started like hitting me with it. And it was so awful. And I ran to the bathroom and, and he stopped, but he had this big smile on his face. It was so creepy. It was really awful. There was one instance where we were arguing about something because I don't know, my spirit wasn't broken at that point because we were still actively fighting, even though he was abusive. And he had hit me square across the face and again, pregnant. And so I fell and, and was just, wow, you know, I need to end this. At that point, I was like, okay, I need to start making a plan. And this was about six months in, I want to say five, six months in. It's fairly common for in abuse situations like this for the, the abuser to, after the incident, somehow come to a change of mind and apologize and say it's not going to happen again. Did he ever, did he make that switch or was he just always in a bad mood? You know, it's funny that you say that. I, I know that that's normal and, you know, they say sorry and then do it again. But in this case, I think he had me so under his thumb, he didn't even feel the need to apologize or make things right. He had me pregnant. He had me locked away. And I think he used that power to his advantage. And, and I, he never said sorry. Never. Did he eventually become okay with the fact that you're going to have the baby? I don't think he ever did. Uh, when I had the baby at that point, he, you know, was like, Oh, I'm going to, I'm a father again. And he has another daughter and they move States away to get away from him. So he was like, Oh, a daughter I can actually see. And to be honest, that scared me a little more. There was one time that you were in the hospital. What was, what happened then? I went to a routine doctor's visit. Um, at that point in the pregnancy, I'm seeing the doctor on a monthly basis. I went in to get checked out. And they said, wow, your blood pressure is so high. Go to the ER right now. Like, don't even wait. Get Leave and go to the hospital. And I did. The ER admitted me. They put me in an L &D, uh, labor and delivery room. And basically, I, I was so – I slept like all day and they had a saline drip in me and – um, at the end of the day, when it was time to pick him up from work, I was so afraid of this man. I was so scared of what his reaction would be if I wasn't there to pick him up that I signed myself out of the hospital against medical advice. Three nurses came in and separately and tried to talk me out of it. No one could talk me out of leaving. I signed my name. I left the building and I went to go pick him up. And I never told him that I was in the hospital. It's hard to believe this is such a dysfunctional relationship with this guy. Mm -hmm. How did you start forming a plan to get away? 
that came in part later. I, I really didn't know what to do. Um, there was kind of leading up to the big incident, what happened that day, I believe it was a Wednesday. He and I were talking as he was driving my car on the way to drop me off at work. And he was talking about, you know, he'll deal with me and just wait till you get home and all these things. And I felt scared. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. He's already, you know, done so much. It only gets worse. I knew that in the back of my mind. So during lunch break, I confessed to my, my friend at work what was happening at home. And she was appalled. And I learned this later, but she had witnessed her mother and father involved in domestic violence and took a very active stand in making sure that I did not go home with him that night. She took me to her house and she clothed me. She fed me. She uh, prompted me to call the police and file a a report on him for the abuse I had suffered, uh, the instances I mentioned before. And nothing really came of it, but I was glad to at least have a record of it, of my report. And that really was was more important to me at that time than the prosecution of those charges, just to at least have it written down that I said he did these things. That coworker is a really good friend. She was amazing. She went through so much. She didn't even have to. And we need more people like that in the world. I try to be that person. Absolutely. Well, this is a, but this is a good thing for people to hear. If someone you work with, a friend or even a relative or anyone even hints at something like this is going on, it's much better to be proactive and say, hey, tell me what's happening. Let's get you out of that situation. So many people don't really know what to do and might say, well, if there's anything I can do, let me know. But you got to be more aggressive than that in helping someone in a situation like this, right? Absolutely. And and one other thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you might be the only person that that person tells and, and they, you know, if, oh, if this person can't help me, no one can help me is the mindset. So when I told her that I was taking it on faith that, you know, something would happen, like it was a cry for help, please help me. I can't help myself. And, and that's really what it is about domestic violence that makes it so unusual is that we know we need help, but we can't help ourselves. Well, you sure picked the right person to confide in. Mm -hmm. So what happened the next day? That whole night, he's blowing my phone up and leaving threatening messages. And what I did was I I didn't actually listen to any of the messages that he left. I, I actually gave her my phone and let her listen to them. And she told me that he was talking about destroying my things and you know, just wait till you get home, things like that. And he was very angry and his anger increased like every time. And so I I knew that it was the right decision, that this was right for me to leave, that there was no going back. And we decided that before work, because we had the same schedule, we're going to drive by my house like an hour early so I can go get my car because I have a set of car keys and he did too. So I was going to go just hop in my car and the two of us are just going to drive to work. As the host of this podcast, I know how important it is to have a website. That's where anyone goes first in order to get more information about a particular episode or to submit their story to be a guest or to find out really anything else about the show. And I need for that website to be live and secure and well-maintained. And that's why I use SiteGround as my web hosting company. I've tried other web hosts and it was okay in the beginning, but eventually I was not happy and shopping around again. But I've been using SiteGround as my website host for more than three years now, and I have no plans to change. And here's why. I know I can contact them anytime, day or night, and someone is there to help. That's a huge comfort, especially when you own a business. In my case, I already had a couple of websites, and when I moved from my old host to SiteGround, they did all the work. I just gave their experts access to my old hosting account, and they took it from there. Everything got moved over seamlessly. My websites get thousands of visitors every day, and there was no downtime for the move. And check out the pricing. You can get started for just $5 a month. They have different plans and pricing for whatever you need. That's why they're the web hosting solution for more than 2 million domain names. If you're ready to have a website for your business, or if you just want to have a nice place to have your blog or anything in between, use my affiliate link to get started. Go to whatwasthatlike.com slash hosting. I've owned websites and used web hosts for more than 20 years, and this is who I use and recommend. 
Get started at whatwasthatlike.com slash hosting. And thanks to SiteGround for providing the website hosting for What Was That Like? We pull into the parking lot. He is actually already in my car with the car on. It's covered parking. We had pulled up right behind and I didn't, my windows are tinted. I didn't even see that he was there until I got almost up to the car. And then I see him there. I run straight back into the car with her and I say, he's in there. We have to go. And and she immediately left. And before we even pulled out of the parking lot for the apartment complex, he was behind us. I was on the phone with 911 because, again, I, I wanted to keep a record of these things. I, I didn't really know how bad it would get at that point, but I just knew that having 911 on the phone was was essential. So we go straight down the street called Babcock. We're going down a couple of miles. We hit green lights the whole way. Everything's fine, but he's still right behind us. He's speeding up, slowing down, like trying to get us to pull over. And uh, she did a U-turn got in line to take a left-hand turn, trying to lose him, basically. I didn't expect her to be, you know, a GTA, you know, driving aficionado or anything. But gosh, he was so determined. I don't think anyone could have gotten away from him, to be honest. At that stoplight she was at, he pulled up right behind us. And then he started hitting her car with my car. So he's driving my car and he's ramming us, reversing, ramming us again, right in the back. At that point, And let me say that I have an aunt that works at police dispatch. And she told me that this was the time when a bunch of the people around me actually dialed into 911 to advise them that this was happening. So he gets out of the car and comes to my window. I'm at the passenger side window. And he starts punching it and said, what did I do? What did I do? Like, if if you can't answer that for yourself, I can't help you. We have the light turn green. We drive away. He's in the middle of the street trying to talk to me. He jumps at his car, takes off, tries to hit us. So I'm like, you know, slow down. Maybe he'll drive past. No, he matches our speed. She does another U-turn about half a mile down this side street. And then she turns onto a residential street, which was which had, had even less people on it, less vehicles. What he did Next, uh, he sped up into us and kind of turned the car into the right-hand side of ours, and that is uh, an attempted pit maneuver. It's a vehicle driving technique that police use to disable a vehicle that they're chasing, and uh, we didn't spin out that time. He tried it one more time about 100 yards ahead on the left-hand side. He did end up spinning our car one time. It did not disable. And then he turned around and actually rammed what was my car into my passenger side door. At this point, I am eight months pregnant. I am heavily pregnant. So he knows, I mean, that I'm about to have this child. And uh, I was so scared at that point. Again, our car is not disabled here. He rams her car, leaves a huge hole in like or a dent in the side of the passenger door. She tries to drive away. He does another successful pit maneuver. The vehicle spins 360, probably more than that, and disables. Cars have a a mechanical thing where if it spins a certain amount, it will actually cut off so that the engine doesn't catch fire or something like that. A safety feature, yeah. Yes. So the car's in drive and off, and we are like perpendicular to the road. So we have our nose kind of facing the ditch at this point on the other side of traffic. What he does next kind of brought me to, you know, understand that I was about to die. Um, At this point, when, when the car spun, I actually lost the phone and the 911 operator hung up on me, actually. We ended up calling back later. But we spun out. I lost the phone. I screamed. The car is dead. She can't restart it because it's in drive. We don't realize that yet. He comes out of his car and with both hands starts punching the window so hard. And and I'm not kidding you. I saw this window bow in two, three inches, like concave. It it was crazy that it didn't break, 
you know, it was a Toyota. So I, I don't know if that says anything special about Toyotas, but it sure was. Uh, I'm so glad that that glass didn't break. He ended up breaking his hand. He had a, a dislocated two fingers uh, at the knuckle punching this window so hard. And he probably didn't even feel that with all the adrenaline that oh, he yeah. had. No way. There, he just kept going. And, and there was blood on the window from where he was punching it. Oh, it was crazy. Um, the next part takes place in about the span of 10 seconds. So what he did next is he walked back to what was my car, opened the back seat. And, and I don't quite remember what exactly the tool was. It was a crowbar or one of those tire irons. I don't remember exactly. But he started walking back to our car. And I knew he was going to hit the window with that. And it would break, obviously. So I had this moment of clarity, like, I, I don't know if it was divine intervention, but I had an immediate moment of here's what you need to do step by step. I told her, put your foot on the brake. She did it immediately. I put her car in park. I turned her keys to turn on the vehicle. I said, go, 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 go. And she bun out and, and drove away. And he was so close to us that when she drove away, the rear quarter panel on the passenger side of her car, so the back tail end, actually knocked him off his feet. And it ended up breaking his hip bone. Uh, he walked with a cane for several years because of that. And we drove away. We ran like two or three stoplights. I said, I hope they pull us over, <laughs> you know, trying to get somebody's attention. You know, we, we safely made sure there was nobody there. We ran these lights. We went right to the police substation. I fully believe he would have followed us if we hadn't run some stoplights because it was full on at that point. Either that or the pain had gotten to him, you know, uh, where he decided to end it because I'm sure he was hurting at that point. We ran to the substation. Um, my door is bowed in. I actually had to eight months pregnant. And I'm a big lady. I'm 5'9". Um, so I had to climb over the seat eight months pregnant and get out of her side, actually, because my door wouldn't even open. Ran barefoot into the substation screaming and the police there are like, what is going on with you? I'm like hiding in the hallway where I can. And we're like, we're just on a, a chase or something. And Gosh, it took so long for the police to arrive. We were literally there for maybe an hour and a half before any police showed up to the substation. And it was then that I learned that police aren't usually at the substation. It's so weird. That's what I was just wondering. What? How did you, who even let you in? Was anybody there? It's like a, there's like a reception area and those folks are not officers. Now they have like detectives in the back um, who are not uniformed patrol. They are like investigators, you know, so they don't handle street violence or anything like that. So we had to wait for uniformed police to show up to actually take our report and take photos of the car and get our story straight and everything. It was an ordeal. He didn't follow you there at all. You didn't see him after that. No, I, I did remember that when we ran our first stoplight, that he stopped at the stoplight. He did not run it. So at that point, I think we had lost him. But, you know, adrenaline runs so heavy. You know, oh, gosh, we were scared for hours. We were just shaking. And, and she, her boyfriend had come and she was crying and he was holding her. And I was just glad to not be in danger anymore because I had realized that I, I had made a, like this internal click of I'm going to die. I really hope that he doesn't cut me. I hope maybe he strangles me so that my baby will live. I had those thoughts and I don't, th I've never been the same. After you almost know that you're going to die and you click that in your head, I, I, <laughs> I'm on meds now, <laughs> counseling, like, uh, and that was five years ago and, and you just never get over that. How did that change your view of death when you come that close to it? I mean, what changes in your mind? Well, it, it definitely brought me closer to God because, number one, you don't realize how close you are, you know, uh, how thin that veil really is between you and the other side. So um, I, I am much deeper into into um, God before than I was before because it, it could happen at any time. It was so... Oh, gosh, I can't even, I can barely use words to describe that. You've heard me talk about Ana Luisa Jewelry. They previously offered my listeners a 10% discount on any of their jewelry. Well, they're doing it again. 
You get 10% off with a special promo code that I'll give you in just a minute. The Ana Luisa name is two words, A-N-A and then L-U-I-S-A, and they're the jewelry company that was founded with the purpose of bringing clarity to the jewelry industry. This is jewelry that not only looks and feels amazing, but every piece is friendly to the earth because the company is entirely carbon neutral. So you can feel good about owning it, and you can be comfortable that the manufacturing process doesn't hurt the environment. Just wait till you get yours and hold it in your hand. You'll know this is high quality and the look is timeless. There's a new collection released every Friday and prices start at just $39. When I first learned about Ana Luisa, it was especially important to me that the pieces are only produced in small, limited batches so they're able to eliminate excessive waste. So you know Mother Nature approves. I had my daughter Bree pick out a piece for herself recently because, you know, I'm her dad and I know she loves jewelry, and she chose the Kuwar necklace. This is a delicate open heart necklace with cubic zirconia gems, and it's crafted in 100% recycled sterling silver and dipped in 14 karat gold. And like all Ana Luisa pieces, it comes with a 365 day warranty. And what did Bree think when she tried it on? This is my new favorite necklace. So now it's your turn. Go to analuisa.com slash what. Go treat yourself and someone you love and use my code what to get 10% off. It's an amazing brand making beautiful, sustainable jewelry. Get yours at analuisa dot com slash what and use the promo code what. And thanks to Ana Luisa for sponsoring this podcast. I had mentioned earlier, you know, I don't really have anyone here that could take me in or or help me. So the closest person was my mother who lives in Corpus Christi. And that is roughly a two and a half hour drive. So I called her and she left work immediately and drove from her job to that substation in in her little uh, Hyundai Tucson (laughs) and uh, hugged me and, and looked at the car and she just started crying and And she hugged me and she hugged the other girl and and she said to the girl, you know, thank you for rescuing my baby, (laughs) you know, and like mamas do. Yeah, that's what, and I I can't imagine the the gratitude that she would feel to your friend for being there for you in that situation. Yeah, I'm sure she, I mean, she would have done anything for me, but gosh, I, I was so happy to have her there and for her to drive me back to Corpus Christi. And she kept me at her house for a couple of days during the search for him. And I felt so safe there because it was nowhere that he knew about. He didn't have any contacts there. I changed my phone number that next day. You know, I was so glad to have her. How was he finally captured? To start off, uh, my uncle, my father's brother, is actually a, a Bear County Sheriff Lieutenant, he took it very personally that someone would treat his niece this way. And his wife is the aunt that is in the dispatch room. So he had some firsthand knowledge from her about the uh, severity of the situation, how dangerous he was. So he started a task force, basically, you know, handpicked a number of uh, sheriff's officers and, you know, gave him the picture and said, we're out to get this guy today. One of those guys called me on the phone and said, you know, he's not at your home. Do you know where he could be? And I knew exactly where he was. I knew which friend's house he was at. So I told the uh, officer how to get there and uh, he ended up arresting him and at that apartment. It it was within 48 hours, I want to say, because it wasn't that very next day. I think it was the day after that on Friday. It pays to know people in law enforcement. (laughs) Oh, yes. Oh, yes. My uncle is my hero in more ways than one. I I love the guy to death because we don't talk too much like, you know, but anything happens to family. We are we are right there. Absolutely. So he was captured. And what was he charged with? The original charge was attempted murder. They had pled it down to two counts of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He was convicted on those two counts uh, via a plea deal, and he took eight years. So he, he got sent away for eight years. And when did he start doing that time? When did he go in? That would be the arrest date, which I know by heart, which is November 19th, 2015. 
So that same day, November 19th, 2023, is the day that he will be released. 2023. Mm -hmm. Seems like a long way off, but it seems like it's going to be here before you know it. Yeah. Two and a half years is a very short amount of time. And I, I'm uh, in a position where he knows my address. You know, I'm just ready to, to change addresses and get us a little uh, a different apartment so we feel a little more safe just because this, you know, he's just going to come right back. And one thing he happened to mention to me one time, this is back when we were still together, was that they issue a restraining order. It's just a piece of paper. It won't stop me from getting through your door. And that scared the bejesus out of me. So I am really focused, you know, being texting and all. I'm going to go ahead and get a concealed carry permit. My dad took me to the shooting range to help me shoot out a, a pistol and a rifle. So I was comfortable with it just for protection because, you know, what's a lady to do? You've got to protect yourself for sure. Has he tried to get out early, like get out on, uh, go for before the parole board or anything? Oh, he sure did. So he qualified for parole four years in, which was not this last year, but the year before. And I wrote a, l a long letter to the parole board and, and they ended up denying him. The year after that, right before parole, he was still sending me letters. And I sent him a letter saying any further attempts will violate the do not contact order because that had been in place. But I had never really stood up and said, you know, stop talking to me. So I did that. And then they turned around and denied his parole again. And now when you look at his information on the offender website, it says offender does not qualify for parole. And it lists three or four reasons, bad behavior, drug use, victimization of uh, other people, things like that are reasons they denied him. So he stopped sending you letters? He, t he stopped trying to contact you from prison? I, he's going on a roundabout way. So I literally received a letter from him last week. It's addressed to our daughter. And the letter is basically to her. But the, I mean, I can read between the lines. I'm, I, I know that it's not to her. I know it's to me. Out of the two of us, I'm the one that reads. So, you know, it, it's just one more attempt to get under my skin, get in my head. And I refuse to let that happen. Can you implement an order that he can't contact her either? Actually, that is an excellent idea. I, I have a court hearing on June 3rd, uh, uh, which is uh, just a continuation of the child support agreement. He, I asked the judge, you know, I don't want any money from him. Just keep him away. And uh, he doesn't have any visitation rights at all, uh, supervised or not. And he doesn't have to pay child support. So I'm, I am going to ask for a uh, restraining order or no contact order for her as well. Yeah, that seems to make sense. Did you ever get your car back? Yes, it took some searching. We ended up, after a, a few days, finding my vehicle in his mother's apartment complex in an area that she doesn't live in. It was parked in a handicap spot. And FYI, I don't have handicap tags. And under the hood, a few wires had been cut. And I don't know the name of the part, but my, I called my dad and he came down and told me how to, you know, go to the dealership and go to the parts guy and, you know, ask for this specific part. And we used the manual and everything. It was a great learning experience for me. Bought the part for 25 bucks, plugged it right on, and the car started again. So I was able to drive my vehicle out of there and at least, you know, get access to it again. But it just goes to show, you know, how determined he was to make this hard for me. Hard to find. And then also parking it in a handicapped spot, it could have, by the time you got there, it could have been towed away. I'm really surprised it wasn't. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got away from this guy. The happy ending, as you've mentioned already, you were pregnant at the time. You, the baby was okay? Joy Victoria is what I named her. And I ended up having to have an emergency C-section. I had a condition called preeclampsia which is basically a big word for hugely high blood pressure. You might have a seizure and we have to take the baby out now. So they ended up taking her out and uh, they did find a heart condition. So she has something called SVT, which is a malformation of her heart muscle. 
she had pediatric cardiologists, EKGs, all these things up until about six, seven months of age when her pediatric cardiologist told me that he's not seeing any more abnormalities. Her heart rate maintains by itself. We had weaned off medicine at this point, really strong medicine, this poor baby. But now she is, you know, one of the best students in her class, has a great attitude, just the best little girl. Her name, Joy Victoria, and the reason I named her that is uh, we are victorious in the joy of the Lord. Because at the end of the day, you know, I have a little girl who is my world and I love her to death. She is just the best little girl. She has so much in store for her and she loves science. She's really the the star of the show. <laughs> yeah. Does she know the history of who her father is? Or have I, you thought about how to tell her that story? You know, with young kids, you don't want to give them information they can't handle. So I have told her because she she's old enough to ask, you know, where's my dad? I, I did tell her that her father was in prison. I did tell her that he was violent and she really doesn't have any interest in speaking with him. Uh, she did have him on the phone once. This is actually the last time that they ever spoke on the phone because he, he did used to call my phone trying to talk to her and, and I did let them speak. Um, she said, did you hit mom? <laughs> and I was like, whoa, that's deep. The girl was like three or four years old. Did you hit mom? And he said, yes, but but I'm so sorry or, or something cheesy like that. And uh, she handed me the phone back and said, I don't want to talk to him. And that was it. So she's kind of detached from it, I think. I haven't really socialized her with him, so she's not missing anything. At this point, and ever since she was born, you are her life, and mm -hmm. that's the way it should be. Yeah. Shereen, if somebody is listening to this and is in a situation like you were in, what would you say to them? I would say that you, you definitely need to tell someone because the overall the dynamic of that type of relationship is one of power and control. You will not be able to leave by yourself. And the most dangerous time in that particular kind of relationship is when the woman or, or the abused person decides to leave. It can be a, a life-threatening type of situation. Any police officer will tell you that DVs or domestic violence calls are the most dangerous. It's just something that you are going to need help with. It's okay to ask for help. You know, you're not weak. You're just in a situation that that requires somebody else to help you. And and hopefully I, I reach out to someone who needed to hear that. You mentioned part of this was the being kind of stuck financially in one place and not and feeling like you don't really have any resources to to go anywhere. What does someone do in that case? Well, what I did and, and what I think a lot of women do is say, you know, oh, I can deal with this. You know, at least I have a roof over my head. We're not on the streets. But let me stop you right there. I mean, being at the, you know, Haven for Hope is the homeless shelter here. Being there on a concrete floor would have been safer than being at home with that man. And, and you really need to evaluate priorities here. You know, the children are watching and they'll learn these things. If they're the girl or if they're the abused person is the woman, then the girls will learn to be abused. And it, it, conversely, if, if the boy, if the man is the one being abused, then the boys will learn how to abuse or how to be abused. And it's a horrible cycle. It'll just continue if you don't do something about it. You know, as, as bad as it was, what happened, it's scary to think about what if you had actually gone ahead and gone home that night? I, I've done a lot of what ifs in my mind. And maybe nothing would have happened that night. Maybe it would have been next week, but it would have happened. I would have been hurt. Something would have happened. It, it always gets worse. It never gets better. As you just heard, what saved Shireen was the fact that she confided in someone. If you're in an abusive or violent relationship, please tell someone. If you don't have a person in your life you can talk to directly, here in the U.S., you can get in touch with the National Domestic Violence Hotline. You can call them at 1-800-799-7233, or you can text the word START to 88788, or you can chat live with someone on their website at thehotline.org. I'll have all of this information in the show notes for this episode at whatwasthatlike.com slash 83. 
And if you enjoyed this episode, there's a previous one you might also like. Episode 24 was with Marina, and she too was attacked by a man while she was pregnant. Here's a clip from episode 24 titled, Marina Was Stalked. And again, he said, the only way. He said, the only way it's going to stop is if you do what I say. And I told him, no, I wasn't going to do it. And the next thing I remember was the grip letting go. And I heard myself scream. I don't remember doing it, but I I heard myself scream. And then I just went limp. I don't remember feeling every one of those steps under my back and my head when I was going down. And at the end of the last episode, I mentioned that I post crazy stuff on Instagram a few times each week. And I told you that anyone who follows me will get a DM from me asking if you have any crazy stories that might work for the podcast. And a bunch of you did follow me over there since then. One person replied to my DM and said, Hey, I heard you say I would get a DM from you, and I actually did. Well, of course, I'm always interested in talking to you, you lover of weird stories. My Instagram is what was that like? And you've heard me talk about the Raw Audio bonus episodes. Raw Audio 16 was just released, and there are some emergency situations and 911 calls that will probably make you angry when you hear what actually happened. In this episode, an elderly woman calls because her house is on fire and she can't move. Okay, what type of building is involved? It's a log house with a tin roof. But it's coming from the roof, I think. I don't know. A man calls 911 while he's driving because he's chasing another car. So you chasing him because he shot your dog? I do, yeah. You're, that's right. Do you know who these people are? I have no idea. And a college student calls for help because her roommate is unresponsive. Oh, my God. Is there somebody out there that can do CPR? No, no, no. I can walk you guys through it. Oh, my God. You can get the full 911 call and the story behind each one by becoming a patron of this podcast for $5 a month. You can do that at whatwasthatlike.com slash support. And if you'd like to contact me, you can message me through the website or by good old snail mail at P.O. Box 5, Safety Harbor, Florida, 34695. And now, here's this week's listener story. Stay safe. I'll see you next time. Hi, my name is Elizabeth, and this is my story of what was it like. When I got out of bed on May 12, 2017, to walk my two German Shepherds, I could never have imagined in a million years what was about to happen to me. I live in Arizona, and because of the heat, I get up at 5 a.m. to walk my dogs. It is my routine every day to walk them along a pathway next to a desert wash behind our local library a few miles from my home. I love the remote quietness of the area. As I drove into the parking lot that Friday morning, just as the sun was starting to rise, I noticed a car and thought it was odd. Usually, no one is there. I leashed up the dogs and began walking down the path I usually walk down. We hadn't gotten very far when I started hearing a loud rasping sound. I looked down to my left where it was coming from, and I saw a man sitting on the ground, his legs crossed, slouched over, and leaning against a brick fence pillar. I approached him and said, Sir, are you okay? I asked him again. No answer. He continued taking deep labored breaths. He still did not respond. He was dressed very neatly in blue jeans, a light blue striped long sleeved shirt, white tennis shoes, and wearing a gold wedding band on his wedding ring finger. Then I noticed the front of his shirt was covered in blood, and blood was pouring out his right temple. I saw what looked like a flashlight near his leg, and I thought, well, maybe he fell. As I got closer, I realized it was the barrel of a gun. I fumbled in my pocket for my cell phone and called 911. I told the dispatcher there was a man covered in blood near the library. Strange things started going through my head, like I was probably going to be late for work, 
Who is going to believe me that I found somebody shot in the head? So I took a picture. Within a few minutes, police cars started showing up. I directed the first responding officer to the location. The officer leaned over and picked up a 22 caliber black revolver handgun laying next to the man's leg and placed it in a bag. As I stood there with my two dogs, more and more police cars kept arriving until the lot was full of red and blue flashing lights. Several officers cordoned off the area with yellow crime scene tape. It felt very strange standing on the inside of the crime scene tape. An ambulance arrived and transported the man to a nearby trauma center. There was an officer assigned to stay with me and my dogs. Finally, the lead officer came over to talk to me. He asked me some questions about who I was and how I came to find this man. I said I was just a complete stranger out walking my dogs. Several hours later, I was finally cleared to leave the scene. I learned from the police that the man passed away four days later. To this day, I don't know his name. I always wondered if I had shown up maybe 20 minutes earlier, would I have been able to stop him? I don't know. I think about him every day when I pass by the spot where I found him.